Mystery Award Theater. Presenting Screwball Division, this week's selection for the Mystery Award Theater. Father O'Halloran lying dead at my feet. Yeah, I know, I know. But there's something mighty strange here. Some questions I want answered. I'll never forgive myself. Leaving him alone here in his study with a world full of hoodlums, kingdom people and the likes, the forces of evil. Kingdom people? Them infidels that would wipe all the Lord's churches from the earth. Only yesterday the father was telling me... Dr. D.E. McHenry, Associate Professor of Political Science and Dean of the Division of Social Sciences, University of California at Los Angeles, mentor of Mystery Award Theater. Dr. McHenry. Ladies and gentlemen, your good sponsor has asked me to select for you each week the very best mystery story my associates and I find in our researches in that popular and instructive literary field. For tonight, I have chosen the particularly fine story by Mr. Anthony Boucher, of which you have just heard the beginning. Mystery Writers of America, National Association of the Most Famous Authors in this field, have made it possible for us to dramatize these selections for you each week. Listen and see if you perceive the peculiar lesson in logic tonight's story contains. From a source which makes me suspect Mr. Boucher to be a student of classical Greek literature... When the show is over, I'll tell you why. This is a very queer deal, and I need facts. That's the best way you can help, Mrs. Gallagher. Okay? Well, it's... Fine, fine. Now, how long were you out shopping? That I can't tell you, Lieutenant. Not to the minute. That nice man at the supermarket, the blonde one, he was showing me snapshots of his young. Yeah, I know, son. I know, but roughly how long? Say, ten minutes. Fifteen, maybe. And what time was this? Well, it was before dinner, because it was all in the oven and a half hour to go yet. And dinner was what time? Six o'clock sharp. The father was always... Yeah, that'd make it about uh, 5.30 you left. Yes, officer. And you got back sometime around a quarter of six, Miss Gallagher? Yes, officer. And found Father Halloran like this with a bullet in him? Yes, officer. (laughs) Yeah. Time of death, 5.30 to 5.45. It's got to be, pending surgeon's report. Lieutenant McDonald, you're not going to go touching him. <laughs> you sound as though you were reading the rookie detective's handbook, Miss Gallagher, about disturbing evidence. But there's just the barest chance that... What is it, Lieutenant? Father O'Halloran's wristwatch. It smashed when he fell. It reads 706. <laughs> Car 28B, go to Peerless Hotel for men, 482 Pacific Street, Skid Row, it's a 211, code 3. Uh, all right, all right now, come clean, friend, you can't get away with it. Honest to heaven, Lieutenant Barker, I don't know nothing. Oh. All right now. You just keep right on saying that, and I'll keep right on slugging you, okay? I was next door in my room when I hears the shot. I looks in here and I says, Grapes, this is where the bulls come in. So I runs downstairs and I finds Finney, the cop on the beat. Honest to heaven, that's all I know. We'll see about that. All right, come on, get up. Uh, this guy with the hole in him is a screwball, Lieutenant. He's one of them kingdom people. What's against everything? Look at them books all around. I tell you... Oh, no, don't! All right, now. That's to make you keep quiet and listen now. First, you want me to talk and... Shut up. <laughs> Maybe this double dome on the floor does belong in the funny house. But that's no excuse for you to kill him. Honest to heaven, all I know is this guy's name's Marsden. That's all I know. Gypsy, you're all washed up. <laughs> now, just listen to what you expect me to believe. 
This room is at the end of the hall. You're in the next room down, you hear a shot. You think this Marsden creep's taking the shortcut home, so you run out and you look in here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't see no rod. You don't meet nobody. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You killed him. Honest to heaven. No! <laughs> you thought stashing away the gun was smart, didn't you, huh? They couldn't pin it on you that way. That's where you were wrong. A gun could have been suicide. <laughs> but, Lieutenant... No gun and it's murder. And you're the murderer, because anybody else would have had to pass you in the hall. I swear it was like I said. I swear it. Yeah. There's one other thing that's phony, Dipsy. How can you be so cockeyed sure about the time? Well, that's easy. I ain't always lived in a flop house. I used to work in a watch factory. Sometimes now I do repairs for Joe's pawn shop over on Main. Joe! <laughs> repairs. <laughs> okay, we know Joe is a fence. You alter identifications for him, huh? Yeah, well, that's going to help you a whole lot. So I'm setting this watch in my room, see, when I hear a shot. Yeah? That's how I know what time it is, Lieutenant Barker. When Marsden gets it, it's exactly 7.06. Car 17A. Go to home of Judge Gregory Westcott. Duckville Road, Compton Hills. It's a 211, code 3. Oh! and this is the first time I've ever seen a judge with a bullet in him. It's very interesting, Lieutenant Finch. But shouldn't you be doing something about it? Eh, I'll always get around to that sooner or later. What are you to the late judge anyway, Mr. Radcliffe? His secretary. Thought you knew. Uh, you know of any threats against Judge Westcott? He didn't move in circles where threats against one's life are commonplace, Lieutenant Finch. Uh, Social-like, huh? Maybe not. But all the same, the judge was on the bench. By crime and Eddie, I've never known a court officer who didn't get threatened sometime by some poor sucker. I'm sorry if you don't find me very helpful. Uh, no way you can narrow down the time, huh? Doctors are always shilly shallying. It's helpful when you can double check on them. No, Lieutenant Finch. The judge always spent the hours from six to eight here in his study, alone. Uh, he often dozed off. I see. I found him like that when I went in to tell him it was almost time for dinner. Yeah, 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 yeah. Huh. Thanks, Wendy. Large grounds. Yes, I, I can see how anybody might slip in all right. Uh, how about the noise? Oh, the curse of civilization. A shot can be so easily confused with... I know, a backfire. Crime and Nettie, I wish I had a buck for every time I heard a witness talk about backfires. I'd be retired and doing nicely, thank you. But the shot wasn't all. There was a brawl in here. I heard nothing. Most of the time, I was right there in the adjoining library. Well, you must have heard something. Well, then it must have happened before I came here, Lieutenant Finch. Around 6.20. Or after I went upstairs to dress at 7.30. So you see... Lieutenant Finch, you're not even listening to me. Cry, my laddie. Look what we've got here, Radcliffe. It seems the judge was murdered at just the time you said it couldn't have happened. What do you mean? Well, don't you see? The electric clock was jerked out of the wall plug during the struggle. Yes, you're right. And it stopped smack on the minute of 7.06. Right to Joe. Barker, come over here. Hey, Andy, another cup of coffee. Well, well, well. If it isn't Lieutenant Finch and McDonald. <laughs> How are Father Time and Young Hopeful getting on? Barker, the screwiest thing. Yeah. Mac here and I had two homicides today. Oh. A priest and a judge. And they both had timepieces that stopped when the murder came off. Yeah, so what? Yeah, but that's not all, Barker. They were both stopped at six minutes after seven. Wait a minute. Are you kidding? It's true. Can you tie anything like that? <laughs> tie it? <laughs> Friend, I can make it look sick. I arrested a Skid Row character named Dipsy today for shooting a creep in the next room. He claims it was an accident, and all he did was hear the shot. Well? At exactly six past seven. Cry, Manetti. <laughs> no. Take it easy, friends. Take it easy. You ain't heard nothing. You can add one more to the judge, the priest, and my kingdom come loony in the flap house. What? Hey, now, wait a minute. What do we got here? Well, uh, while I'm booking this dipsy personality, a call comes in from a prowl car squad. They just dragged a dentist out of his burning office. What's the tie-in? Oh, he was toasted up pretty. And a nice, handy little smashed wristwatch to show he kicked off at, uh... <laughs> I'll give you one guess what time. 7.06? Yeah. 
Look here. There's something haywire. If we three play our hands right, we can make sense out of it. Four men don't die at exactly 7.06 just to confuse the cops. There's a pattern here. <laughs> Nuts. Okay, Barker. I know you're smart. You've got a sweet record of convictions. And we won't talk about how you got them. <laughs> but I was in this game when we used to wear stars for badges, and I know a screwball set up when I see one. Strange, I repeat myself, nuts. It's just chance. Yeah, four men, too many for chance. Brother McDonald, nothing's too many for chance. I've been in Padrino's gambling joint when the wheel came up red, 23 times running, and me with my money on the black all the time. I switched to the red, and on the 24th, bingo. She's black. Yeah. Well, there's no pattern. It's all chance. Well, play in on this, Barker, and I swear it won't do your rating any harm. <laughs> no, 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 no. Deal me out, friends. I got better things to do tonight than play games with you. <laughs> anyway, I've got my murder all locked up and softened and ready to sing. <laughs> so nuts to you, my friend. Hey, Finch, we got to get to the bottom of this. Yeah, sure, Mac. Me with the oldest lieutenant's commission on the force and you with the newest. Could be. We might. Yeah, but where do we start? It's like shooting a gun full of blanks and not even having a target. Well, first we call ballistics. About that dentist who got scorched out. Ballistics? But Finch, he, he was... I will get you ten. There's a bullet in that body. And it came from the same gun as the other three. Then we're going to meet up with a fellow. Yeah, who's that? Well, son, I've sort of shown you the ropes like around this department. You know all about the vice squad and the chem lab and Lord knows what else, but... There's one section you never saw before tonight. Huh? We live and learn. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to learn all right, young fellow. We're headed for the Chula Negra Cafe, sometimes known as the Screwball Division. Come on. <laughs> listening to Mystery Award Theater and this week's selection written by Mr. Anthony Boucher, Screwball Division. Doesn't look like he's going to show up, Pinch. Nick Noble, the head of the Screwball Division, always shows up at the Chula Negra. He operates from this booth. Hmm. Sounds like a queer duck. Well, Nick's had a bad time at it. Sharpest man in the department once. Then he took a political rap for a captain. Oh. Just about the time he got kicked out, his wife died. And now, well, <laughs> he's just another wino. Hmm. I don't see how a bum like that's going to help us. Ah, but he still can think. Maybe 99 cases out of 100 you can crack with a lab or with a piece of hose the way Barker does. But the hundredth one, Mac, needs a man like Nick Noble. Thank you, Lieutenant Finch. I'm right on cue. Huh? Oh, Nick, sit down. We were waiting for you. Yeah. Remarks most flattering. Friend? Yeah, Nick. Lieutenant McDonald, homicide. Just breaking in. Friend, how are you? Irrelevant and immaterial. Huh? Always carry my own bottle. Connoisseur. Authority on vintages unfit for human consumption. Want him to play something special for you, senor? Yeah, here's a buck. Tell him to stop playing. I'm afraid it's up to you again, Nick. Tell me, um, see a fly on the end of my nose? <laughs> you, you still seeing that fly? Uh, no. Now, listen. I really got a crazy one for you this time. Give. Well, first, we got a priest named Father O'Halloran. McDonald finds him and... four guys off to their heavenly reward at six minutes after seven. All through? Well, what more do you want? Well, you don't even seem interested, Noble. Fly on the end of my nose. Well, what do you make of the setup? <laughs> Questions. Okay. Dentist. No name? Not yet. 
I'm supposed to phone back and check. Check now. Find out all about him. Especially if he's doing any kind of important work for the state. Huh? <laughs> well, I won't ask why. Anything you say. I'll be right back. More questions, young man. Sure. Are you quite certain there's no... No, no, sir. There's no fly on your nose. Mm. This man on Skid Row, this Marsden, occupation? None. Unless you can't stand it on street corners passing out pamphlets. Pamphlets for what? Oh, kingdom come, something or other. A lot of crackpots. People of the kingdom? Yeah. Yeah, I think that is what they call themselves. Father Halloran's housekeeper mentioned them. Mm. Strange people. Deny all rights of authority. Oh, forgive me if I return to my sherry. Sure, go ahead. I can see we're going to get no place fast. Now look, I'm Noble. A nessie, Nick. You always can pull a rabbit out of your sherry bottle. What'd you find out, Finch? The dentist. His name's Lyle Varney. He's foreman of the special blue ribbon grand jury investigating graft. I'll say he's working for the state. But how did you guess, Nick? And they had a bullet in him from the same gun that killed the other three. Right. Well, what are we going to do? Pretty problem. Pretty pattern. Thanks, Finch. Like old times. Hmm. Proof tomorrow. <laughs> Don't mind him, Mac. He can't help grandstanding. No grandstand. Murders tied together. Motive for time not quite clear yet. Only one murderer possible. Hey, you mean we... Tomorrow. Can... Don't rush it. Yeah, but if there's a murderer loose, well, it's our job to prevent crime, isn't it? <laughs> Very young. All right, boy. No danger. No more murders. Not possible. Well, I'm glad you're so sure. Now, go home. Tomorrow, boys, I'll show you your murderer. Now, look here, Noble. Don't you believe in lights in the hall, Doctor? Doesn't speak well for the peerless hotel for men. Never mind that. Just because once you was a cop don't mean I gotta do everything you say. There was a murder in that room, and I can't let you in. Rather discuss the little racket you practice here? I know, but every time you stick your nose into something, more cops show up. You draw them like flies. Don't, don't mention flies, Doctor. No, but you know I'm trying to run a respectable flop. I mean, hotel for gentlemen. I had enough trouble with that Dick Barker. He had Dipsy up here and broke a bureau and two chairs. Inconsiderate of Dipsy. His room? Yeah. And that one next to it was Marsden's. Want to take a look in there? Mm, all right, Noble. I shouldn't ought to let you do this. Can't mean nothing but trouble. There ain't nothing to see. It's just another room. Mm. Left a lot of pamphlets. Read them somewhere else, will you, Noble? That kingdom of the people fella always gives me the creeps. Hmm. Interesting. The number of the beast again. Huh? Six. 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 Well, what does that mean? And why am I asking? You should know your scriptures better. Well, I... Quiet, Doctor. Someone in the hall. Going into Dipsy's room next door. Put the light out. Doctor. What are you going to do? I don't want nobody else to get killed here. The same day, I mean. Have to see who it is, why he's here. Oh. Taking a big chance. Might see you in the dark behind that flashlight. Did you come back to... got yourself killed, that Dick Barker will massacre me. Yeah. All right. Help me out. Sure, sure. 
you see who it was? Too dark. Oh, better get your head fixed up. You've got a lump the size of a coconut. Yeah, Doctor. You might call it the mark of the beast. Car 14B, go to Padrino's Green Grotto, West Figueroa. It's a 211, code 3. Padrino's cold as a mackerel in a deep freeze, right through the heart. I, I don't get it, Mac. I never saw Nick slip up before like this. He was so sure there wouldn't be another murder. Uh, not that I'm sorry to see Padrino go. It's one way to close up a gambling joint. But there's a killer still loose, and we don't know where he's going to strike next. Yeah, this pattern's getting deadly monotonous. You can bet ballistics will find the bullet and Padrino checks with the others. From the same gun. The same pattern. He got plugged sometime between 1 and 3 a.m. But this here watch on his wrist was broken and set to 7.06. Yeah, come in. Old screwball here insists on seeing you, Lieutenant Barker. Uh, who's that? Name? Nah, don't tell me I know. You're a Swiss bell ringer and you lost your way. This is Dick Noble. Used to be in the department. Oh? <laughs> he ought to listen to some of these yarns, Lieutenant. <laughs> Look, character. It's nearly 7 o'clock and I've got a date tonight. So why don't you make like a homing pigeon and uh, get back to your bottle? Try to see Finch or McDonald. Not around. You had one of those 706 cases. Marsden, the flophouse fanatic. People of the kingdom. Okay, friend. What's the angle? All solved. What? All the cases at six after seven o'clock. Yeah, solved. I have no use for glory anymore. Credit better for the force. Uh -huh. You heard there was another guy bumped off with a watch set at the same time? Yes, Padrino. That's a part of it. Want to hear? <laughs> Why not? Fly on my nose. Can't get him out. Come on, come on. Look at the murders, Barker. Pattern. Leave out Padrina now. Just the ones yesterday. Yeah? Three deaths, timed mechanically. Fakes. Priest, judge, dentist. One death appears timed accidentally. Your case. Marsden. Time true. Where does that get you, friend? Look at the men. Three represent authority. Priest, authority of church. Judge, authority of law. Dentist, authority of state. Foreman of grand jury. What are you building to? Your case. Marsden. People of the kingdom. They hate authority. <laughs> you don't smoke reefers, too, do you? Look at time. Six minutes after seven. Why that particular time? You tell me. Seven o'clock is also 6.60, isn't it? You're positively brilliant, Buster. Add the six minutes past seven and you get the number 666, number of the beast. You find it in the scriptures, the apocalypse, tied up in all the prophecies. No, you don't say. Great number with people of the kingdom. The beast means the state, the church, everything they hate. Hmm. That's smart stuff, Frank. Well, go on, what next? Easy. Your man's the murderer. You mean the jerk I've got in the can, Dipsy? <laughs> For sure. He killed Marsden, all right. But he couldn't have killed those others. Not him, Barker. Marsden, your corpse. My... Oh, now, wait a minute. He had the only motive. Nobody could want to kill him and the priest, the judge, and the dentist. But he'd want them dead. He faked the 706 in each case for the greater glory of the people of the kingdom. But in his own case, the time was real. Picked that time to kill himself, to round things out, and match... With the phonies. Mm hmm And how about the gun? Why didn't I find it? Your prisoner, Dipsy, hid it in his room. Chance for quick money. Worked with a fence. Won't admit it now. Scared of murder rap. That's the picture, Barker. <clears throat> uh, that's pretty good, no? Pretty good. But just about as crazy as you are. How about Padrino? Marsden didn't crawl out of the morgue to nail him. I know that. Well... That's why I'm here. No use hounding a dead man. Get the live murderer. 
What did Padrina have on your bark? How much money were you into him for? You're drunk. Looking for something in the drawer? Shut your head. Martin killed the other, so somebody else killed Padrino. Yeah. Same time pattern, but authority pattern not there. So pattern was fake to shift guilt. What do you expect to do with that gun? Can't you guess, genius? Only Finch, McDonald, and you, Barker, knew about the time pattern, the 706. Yeah. Finch and young McDonald were somewhere else when you were at the Peerless Hotel on Pacific Street last night. I checked. A lot of good it's going to do you, Noble. Keep your head, Barker. You can't kill me here at headquarters. No? <laughs> Everybody knows you're a bum and the worst kind of wino. Yeah. You've been brooding all these years about being booted off the force. You came in here to get revenge. I had to defend myself. You went back to Gypsy's last night to steal the gun and get rid of it. You thought when you hit me that you just sapped another bum in the hall. Right. And you thought even if they placed you there, what would my word be against the lieutenant? Different now, isn't it, Barker? Got any last words, sucker? Better get them off your chest because I'm... <laughs> oh, I... The trap worked, Noble. But I should have let him have it between the eyes. No. Oh. No, it's better you just nicked him. A cop who turns out to be a killer doesn't deserve a quick kiss off. Take it easy, Barker. Yeah. You're all through. Yeah. Well, you're wrong, Finch. All right, Noble. Stay right in front of me now. Stay the window, the window ledge leads to the Come back here, Barker. Yes, yes. You see, I had this figured out too. If you put the arm on me for taking care of that rat, Padrino. Finch, don't shoot. You'll hit Noble. Yeah. yeah so, still make my plan perfect on it, sir. Yes, perfect to the eye. Perfect to the end. Gentlemen, look at the clock on the desk. Almost perfect to that. 7.05. Now, Dr. McHenry with his analysis of tonight's story. And so Barker was trapped by logic, the logic of the consistent pattern of events. In like manner, when we read the news and see the pattern in what people do, we can judge the candidates for whom we vote or the nations we help or oppose. Thus, in our recreational literature, too, we discover valuable instruction brought to us this time by poor old Nick Noble, a strange modern counterpart of the ancient Greek oracle of Delphi, the mystic counselor to whom the public officials of Greece went with problems too puzzling for them to solve. The oracle found solutions after inhaling mystic vapors and imbibing a liquid. The Delphic oracle, you see, is a classic parallel for the wino in the restaurant booth. But that's getting into the author's field, and I think you should meet him. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Anthony Boucher. Thank you, Dr. McHenry, for a penetrating analysis and for your dramatization. It was a grand presentation of my story. Uh, may I say a word on behalf of my colleagues? You certainly may. From my association, the Mystery Writers of America, I want to thank you for this splendid way of using our work. We'll continue to make our very best available to you. What have you chosen for next week? A story on which I know you'll agree with me. Pieces of Silver by Mr. Brett Holliday your famous creator of Michael Shane. Oh, yes. One of his best. Join us again at the same time next week. Hear the weird story of a man killed to protect a young girl, but killed for an act not of his, but of the girl's own father. Mystery Award Theater is produced by Lee Crosby and George L. Fogel. Mystery.